Learn how to build a better sign and print shop from a few crusty sign guys who've made more mistakes than they care to admit. Conversations and advice on pricing, sales, marketing, workflow, growth, and more. You're listening to the Better Sign Shop Podcast with your hosts, Peter Kurunis, Michael Riley, and Bryant Gillespie. Before we jump into the episode, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, GCI Digital Imaging, grand format printer to the trade. We talk a lot about outsourcing on the podcast and the importance of having good partners. And GCI Digital Imaging is a good partner to have. Owner TJ Bedact and his team focus on providing killer customer service, just the way grandmother used to make it. If you're interested in learning their approach to business, hop back into the archives to episode nine, where the guys and I interview TJ about customer experience. So if you're looking for a high quality trade printer for banners, wraps, and other printed graphics that your customers throw at you, check out GCI Digital Imaging at printgci.com. All right, guys, we're back with the next edition of the Better Sign Shop podcast. With me, as always, the Sign Shop Yoda, wearing the baby Yoda helmet or hat, got Peter Karunas. How are you, Pete? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm happy that No Shave November is over. At the film, at the time of this podcast, it is now December 1st. I finally shaved it all off. It was getting ridiculously long. Really excited about that. Also, I am a year older. I just celebrated my birthday, so I am now oh. a whopping 38. 38. Oh, congrats, dude. I didn't even know it was your birthday. I feel like I know. I'm... every uh, Everybody wished me a happy birthday on Facebook. Everybody did. I even think Chris did. But, I, but you, I not, but, but you, me. well, my main squeeze forgot what, what, that it's my what, birthday. What a jerk. What a jerk. Mike did. Sorry, dude. My, Mike did. Sorry, dude. Mike's not here, but he, I'll give him props. He was like, happy birthday, man. Appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. I'm sorry, dude. I apologize. I'll make uh, it you're knee deep. De- you're knee deep in like every little bit of project. So I get it. You'll have, and, a, you get and, a pass. And, and flu season too. So. Yeah, we're missing the signed burrito, the chimichanga. It's not as fun when he's not here to do the nicknames, but I know we had um, hey, what was the what was the one that Chris gave him the sign sign design samurai. That was a good one. I don't know, man. I don't. Isn't he like the sign shop general? The sign sign the master signs. general. Yeah. I, listen, we just need to stick to something between you and I. We just need to like. We need to make him like a name plaque for Christmas. Like that's it. Like that that's gonna be it. It's gonna be set in stone. Like if and if I had it my way, that chimichanga would definitely be the winner for me. I, I like the chimichanga for sure. Crusty on the outside, fluffy on the inside. <laughs> love it. Love it. Updates from me, man. I've been at home with my wife sick all week, and I, I gotta say I've got a newfound respect for everything that she does on a daily basis. Mm. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, but you, you have no idea type of thing. <laughs> like I see everything that she does throughout the week and how she keeps our house hold together and does everything for the kids. Uh, but, but like actually doing all that and try to take care of the kids and your wife and still have some type of involvement in work is extremely difficult and she does it every single day so i feel like i have to give a shout out to my wife i hope you feel better by the time this is released if not we're gonna have a problem but i you're amazing um ah you are amazing you are you're all amazing you're all amazing your girls are amazing you're amazing you you're a very generous guy you and you know what you wouldn't be the man you are today without the strength of a strong woman behind you Mm -hmm. There you go. Behind every good man, great woman. Is a great woman. Yeah. So what are we talking about today? We are talking about a question that has come up over and over again from a lot of our owners that we've talked to either in our Facebook community for sign shop owners, plug, plug, or on some of our mastermind calls 
which is, hey, I am in a small town, small-ish town, depending on how you define small. How do I grow my shop? How do I grow my business? And we've got a special guest joining us today, one of my best friends in the whole state of Texas, probably my best friend in the state of Texas, Chris Flanagan. Chris runs Real Graphics, and they have bought up just about every other printing and sign business in their small town of Lufkin, Texas. And like, seriously, every time I talk to him, he's bought another business there in town. So excited to jump into that conversation with him. All right. So we're back from technical difficulties. We've got my man, Chris Flanagan from Real Graphics in Lufkin, Texas, joining us. Uh, As I mentioned, Chris is probably my favorite dude in the state of Texas. And I know there's a ton of dudes down there. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Chris. All right, man. So what's the origin story? Like, give us, give us the real graphics story because every time I talk to you, you've bought another business (laughs) or you've expanded or you've, you've got all these different things going on. And how big is your team now? They're, they're like, we still have around 25 people. Because uh, we'll get up there sometimes, but I think 25 is a good average. Sometimes we might peak up at 28 or so. Yeah, happy to share. So uh, I love hearing in the group all these comments about how people stumbled into the sign business. No one intentionally planned it. My story's kind of similar along par with that as far as, you know, I was planning to do, do youth ministry work. I had been impacted by a great youth pastor growing up. And I was like, man, that's what I want to do. Have fun with teenagers hang out and have fun on forever. And and that's what I kind of started out doing. And then along the path, you know, different churches that I was involved with and working at, design came up, designing graphics and logos, making videos to getting things printed, getting shirts printed, things like that. So along the path, just figured out stuff along the way to making things happen. I I really enjoyed that part. And so years into it, I was still a, a single youth guy, you know, having a good time doing the youth ministry side, but needed to make a living. And so uh, one of the youth pastor buddies met, said some magic words to me one time. He said, hey, how much would you charge me to design a poster, an event poster for my group and print it for me? And I was like, man, yeah, heck yeah, 25 bucks, man, I'll, I'll make you a poster. And it just kind of started <laughs> the idea of like, I could do this for other people, but it never was an idea of like, i have a business one day, you know, it just was, it it just happened. And so my passions kind of just tweaked that way. And I just enjoyed working with customers on projects and what, you know, and if my first year I was just, you know, side hustling and doing this and that, and and they would, you know, throw the burden on me of like, Hey, here's the, here's what I want. And then we'd make an event poster, a flyer, and then we'd go get shirts printed or whatever, for whatever events going on and things like that. So I was just kind of middleman in a lot of it. And that's kind of how much did you earn that first year? Yeah, not enough to stay afloat, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, so I like you know, throw like a number out at me. No, I really have no clue. Like, there was no oh, oh, books you. involved. Oh, it was like oh, write that check <laughs> yes. to Chris Flanagan, and uh, <laughs> you know, you got cat. You know, it was really simple, but that really did just start like this new excite, my excited passion. And so within that year, kind of was starting a business, and luckily I put the name Real Graphics on it because I was going to do like real design and a real. Printing. I was so close on those, and luckily graphics was a broad one, so it worked out for the future. Um, but that's kind of how I stumbled into it, and then just kind of slowly got going. Um, you know, I, I rented a little office space just because I bought a little poster printer that was an antique what, at the time. What Design year was jet. When you got started, two thousand seven. Into two thousand seven, I rented a little office space. And uh, I bought a nineteen ninety five <laughs> HP Design Jet. 3005 CP printer that was 10 or 12 years old used many times before me. And uh, anyway, but that kind of helped me get limping along. At least I could add something in the office to hit print on. Uh, But anyway, I started with that and then was outsourcing. And so nowadays, like fast forward, we do a lot of stuff in house, but it comes from those pain points that I had of outsourcing and just relying on someone else. And not that, I mean, great vendors is what got me here, but just that's, that was what it was all about at first. I couldn't do anything but print a poster in house but yeah, I just had a good time doing that. And then I, I would hustle it along too. I had a day job for a year working at our local newspaper. I talked him into hiring me with this much design experience. And uh, you know, I enjoyed, I mean, he was making like newspaper ads and it wasn't that exciting, but it was really good practice and it got me all like fast and quick. But I would like 
plan meetings at my office at my lunch break. So I'd be like, you know, oh, yeah, I can talk to you about that shirt project. How about noon? And I'll see you at the office. And I'd rush over across, the, you know, down the street to my little design shop office where I had you know, a little desk and a little printer in the corner. That was it. And uh, but it was that's kind of how I got started that first year. And I just kind of planned it around that. So every day I'd pretty much have a noon and a five o'clock meeting. And then I'd work in the evening getting the stuff done. But I was the, the shirt maker, the sign printer, you know, just vinyl cutters, you know, all they that stuff. All show for the first while. And then, uh, but yeah, fast forward down the road, man. I had an intern along the way that was really good help. Kind of a guy that came along, wanted to learn some stuff, jumped in. Uh, eventually, I paid him a little something every week. Um, eventually, I got an email from a girl that was a design student and um, wanted to get some experience. So this was 2010. And I'm like, man, I got a lot of work going on, a lot of different projects at that time. And I was like, I can give you experience, but no pay. And the girl was desperate and said, sure, she'd love it. And uh, came in and she was fantastic. Like, she really knew her, like, knew more than me. When I said I needed the artwork like this and vector and, you know, paths welded together, fonts out and outlined, she knew it all. And it was amazing. And then her creative ability was way beyond me um, I, I like faked it up to get us going but like she was a talented artist a talented designer um by the end of the summer she's fallen in love with me and ended up marrying this girl so i met my wife uh, in the business um so that was really amazing so she was a huge asset though that really just took our design to the next level and i think foundation of our success really has been that really good design creativity um over delivering customers what they kind of come in expecting or asking for uh, if we can wow them with the design, they're hooked. They're going to love getting the sign or whatever it be. And so we could kind of run from there. So Question that's for the, you, dude. Yeah. If if we play this back for him, are, is she going to be mad that you called her desperate? Well, no, I mean desperate for <laughs> some work. She said, no. I'm, I'm just picking, man. Yeah, I'm no, she, she, she said, she's like, she sent out all these emails and like no one emailed her back. And I was the only person to respond and say like, yeah, you could come and get some experience here. So it worked out. But but like two weeks in, I was like, hey, I got to start paying you something because like she really was helpful. I was expecting her just to be a body in the shop, but I had to teach along the way. You know, I didn't expect for her to have such a great grasp on everything. So it was really, really great. Um, but then, and then it just kind of fell in place because like she went back to school for a while and we actually did start dating and stuff long distance. But like other people started falling in my lap, basically like for great talented people like another great designer came in joined the team um from there just other good like production team my brother started working with me around that time it was really great at the production side of cranking out signage weeding vinyl installing vinyl so we figured a lot of stuff out in those early years which was really fun and exciting but exhausting at the same time you guys know how that goes but that was kind of the path we got going and then every few years it just seemed like we kind of get to another level of buying a piece of equipment that would allow us to do more. Eventually, we maxed out our little 2,200-square-foot space that we grew into, and there was no more space to grow into in that building. In 2016, we bought this uh, building right now, and it was a 13,000-square-foot building. We've added on a little bit. So we're at 15,000 square feet now, and that was a game-changer because it really let us grow the business as we needed to. I mean, back in the old shop days, if we needed to cut an aluminum panel sign down, it was set up table up outside running yeah. extension cord I mean, I've, just, I've done that i can't terrible, tell you how, how, how many panels that we cut in yes. half on a, a couple of saw horses out back of the the old shop if i had standard operating procedures back then it would be pretty fun <laughs> you know, like first run the extension cord second get the saw horses third whatever you know oh, it was rough man it was rough sure it was, you, you know AC good days blade in there uh, what was ACM? I don't even know if I figured out what ACM was four <laughs> years later, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many, like I went to my supplier one time to pick up stuff. Cause I got in a desperate pitch. So I had to drive a couple hours to like, go get something. And I'm in there and I'm like, what is this? Oh, that's PVC board. I didn't know. I mean, like, I, you know, no one, there was no sales rep in my area coming to say, Hey, these are the things you need to do. I just, if you didn't know to ask for it or whatever, and their websites back then, you know, really stunk. Man, I learned a ton just walking through that warehouse. I was like, can you walk me around? Let me just see what substrates you yeah. have. And it was light bulbs going off. I think that's seriously whenever I found out about ACM panel by just seeing it. I'm like, I need this. What is it? You know? Yeah. So, man, I wish someone would have taught me along the way. But figure yeah, out things that we know now, right? Shoot. Yeah. So anyway, so that that's kind of the, the beginning. And uh, we're in Lufkin. Uh, Lufkin's about a 50,000 people town. 
We're surrounded by, the, in the county, a lot more little cities around us. So we got about 100,000 people in our one-hour reach, uh, which has helped us to grow, I think, in a town our size. And um, but one thing that we've had to do is we've kind of grown, what I say, sideways in our abilities to do more for our customers, because there's not a lot of people that are doing all these different things. So if they can come to one shop, get more things done, I think that's helped us to survive and grow through these years. Because there's been times where maybe a January, February, where shirt business really slowed down, but at least we were doing signage and all these other things to stay afloat. I remember one year we were doing a lot of websites and luckily, man, we did hardly any signage and very little other stuff in December, but we did several website builds and it really helped carry us through. And so I think offering a lot of stuff in our smaller rural area has been a big, big help to our survival and growth through the years. So yeah, that's kind of how we got started and everything was outsourced. And then basically it would become a pain point like t-shirts, for instance, we would outsource to one guy down the street, uh, did a good job, but we got to a point where our, our orders were getting bigger and more frequent. And eventually we had to do something about it. Started printing t-shirts in my brother's garage. Um, eventually built a little portable building shop behind our office. And that roughed us through a few more years until we were able to move into the building right now. You know, but like a lot of things that limited us in the shop we were in before when we started going was like, we didn't have 220 power to add any, like the latex printers we wanted. You know, we didn't have space for it anyway. You know, laminator had to be done elsewhere. I mean, it's just a lot of pain points. Installs, we'd borrow a shop down the street to go do some installs at at a tip shop. So we just had to do a lot of flexing to make things work and took a lot of energy to do simple tasks. When we got this build, bigger building, a lot of those things became more routine and allowed us to start growing and kind of scaling up a little bit better. So that was a huge help in our growth. And so now we offer printing. Yeah. Talk to us about what you, give us the, the whole scope of what you guys offer, what you guys offer in house, because you guys do like a, out of every shop that I've talked to, you guys might do the most stuff in house that I've ever seen. So when you walk in, we've got a front sales team. So we have three or four sales reps. Uh, they're talking with customers, taking orders, through phone, email, or in person. Um, and then you go back from there. We got production starts. We have an apparel department running embroidery, sublimation, uh, DTG, and screen printing. We've got a full small format print shop. So we're doing digital printing. And it's, I mean, I'd say a smaller operation, but just real versatile. So notepads, envelope printing. We do a lot of mailers, um, direct mail stuff. So we're preparing it, sending it straight to the post office, um, postcards, all those great things in paper. Does everybody still do NCR forms? In Man, Texas? they are running like, <laughs> seriously, no. All right, right now they are running numbered NCR forms and it's a big long run of so many thousand. And so they're like, don't, don't stop anything. It's just, they don't want to interrupt the numbering. So those are still running hot right now. Uh, that used to be popular. bread and butter for us on yeah, some of yeah. the, like the local businesses, like especially like the service businesses, like the plumbers or the yeah, man. contractors. Like, hey, we got to have the three part numbered tickets because that's how everything is organized in a, a cabinet hey, somewhere. We can even bite it in a booklet for you, man. We could do yeah. this. We got you. So yeah, stuff like that. The print shop's super great and versatile, you know, all the way down to like printing some invitations for baby shower and, you know, dressing the envelopes, mailing them out, turnkey. So real versatile on that. Our signage department is pretty wide. In signage, we have the vehicle wraps, decals and vehicle wraps for vehicles, sign production items like yard signs and banners and those types of things. Um, and then also in that same area is the sign fabrication, building you know, sign cabinets, installing channel letter sets, doing installs for uh, electrical signs. Um, we finally actually done a couple uh, digital board signs. That was something we've been growing into the last few years. And so, um, but yeah, so pretty versatile little shop. We have engraving also in signage, laser engraver, flatbed printers, uh, laminators. Uh, we got a 10 foot wide roll printer. So we do more banners in house. We got a couple latex printers to keep the vinyl getting printed and wraps and stuff like that. So versatile shop. We're not the biggest. We're not, I mean, I love seeing some of the bigger ones that just are running all these flatbeds and running, you know, just all this. So, but we're very versatile. And so it's all about just kind of, there's, there's hardly anything you guys couldn't produce in house. And so we do love that 85 to 95%, depending on the month is done in house. So very few like fabric display stuff, we, you know, we outsource that probably will always outsource that you know, every now and then there's some unique printing products of like foil printing, um, some things like uh, specialty you know, laminations of paper products. We might outsource those jobs. But yeah, we love being able to kind of keep a 
a hold on all the quality, the pricing, the stuff. But the downside, and I mean, Peter, you you could definitely go off of this one for me, but is all the headaches that come with that. You know what I mean? I've heard you guys comment about some of the beauty of sending some things out and let someone else do it, focus on what they're good at, you know, but kind of been in that struggle. So uh, yeah, it's just been good. And I think just, man, I think our town, or maybe it's not just me, but I, I swear we're last minute Lufkin. You know, it just seems like everything's always at a rush. You know what I mean? Like the Christmas parade, we know it's coming in December every year, but all week has been, could you print me the, you know, and it's like, so to have those abilities in house, it is awesome to be able to come through with customers. And, and it's not a big deal to like, Hey, you know what, what's six more sheets of quarterplast running on that printer today. It's, it's great. It's good. But if we didn't have that ability in house, we would be in a tight spot and have to say no a lot more. So I do love that, but I think I'm getting the gray hair from keeping all those things going. And there's not three pieces of equipment that could break down today. There's 20, you know, so there's so many more things that could go wrong and, and problems to overcome. And so that's I, kind I of, I don't think that's um, that last minute deal. I don't, I don't think that's a Lufkin problem. No, I'll just, okay. I'll just tell you. There. <laughs> and I think that's why the sign shop groups have been such good therapy this last year is just like, okay, you know, I'm not the only one or we've done that too. And so it's been kind of good to hear some other guys' stories and, and relate. Yeah. Especially in the industry that's you know, traditionally kind of closed off, you know, that's, that's where we're having a lot of fun with this on the, the podcast and the group and everything. I know Peter and I and Michael, like this has been, yeah, probably the highlight of my sign career. I would say getting to just talk shop with everybody every single yeah. day. Yeah. But and I love that the signage community seems to be a lot more open and helping and probably plenty critical, but maybe a little supportive but like apparel side, like I don't think screen printers, like they don't share tips as much. They're not like, I don't think as much as the signage. So, I mean, we do a little bit of both and some, you know, you know, different groups and stuff. And, you want to know why? But, yeah. You want to know why? I have a theory on this and okay. I actually believe you. Uh, not only I believe you, I agree with you. And you're in the screen printing business, which I came from, Brian's part of, you know, you, you, you dabbled in it as well. There's really not too many ways to skin this cat, Right. You have to burn screens. You have to get a silk screen machine. You have to dry it. If you can't figure it out, you shouldn't be in the business, right? From a design perspective, setting up your processes, setting up your, your, your spot colors, burning those screens, it's all the same. Nobody does it differently. Maybe some people do it a bit more efficiently. They have larger shops, better equipment. Okay. Okay. But I'm not going to talk to you about how to set up your shop and compete with me, yeah. right? Because yeah. it's the same – Because uh, I'll take this from a pricing course. It's the same unit of work, right? Yeah. You, the, the same medium every time. You know, like yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's, it's kind of freeing because, hey, you know you're printing on a garment and hey, depending on your palette size, like, hey, we're not going to do anything other than like 12 by 16 or 14 by 20 or something on a – a t-shirt or a bag or a hoodie. So it, those constraints are, are definitely cool on the design side where you're kind of working against and you come up with different ways to decorate a shirt or, you know, make it stand out. But yeah. process wise, it's, yeah, it's, I could, I could buy the shirts from the same place. I right can cool. buy my ink from the same place. Yeah. You know, so from, in a lot, in a lot of areas, when you're in a, when you're a shirt shop, it's all about efficiency. Can you? How quickly can you pump out a shirt for a customer to pay a, a price that's probably pretty consistent in almost every market, mm -hmm. right? Sure. I can buy the shirts the same place. I can get the ink from the same place. Okay. So that's why I believe that there isn't a lot of help in that industry because yeah. it's very consistent. Learn it. Watch a YouTube video. Almost everybody does it the same way. In the sign business, and everybody here knows this, but so I might be stating the obvious, but there are so many ways to skin a cat. I could show you an image of a sign, and we all can come up with probably a dozen ways that that could be made. And that's also what fluctuates the price. That's also what fluctuates the workflow, the cost, the labor factor. So there's a lot more moving parts in this business. And and before we kind of dump, jump into it here, Chris, I, I kind of want to go back to the beginning part of this conversation, if we may. You know, Bryant gave you a really great introduction, but we never really touched it. What businesses other than this one do you own? 
And how do you afford that time to do it all? Working on the time part. Sign business was the main thing, got going. I've always thought the storage unit business was interesting. And so when a customer came in as 2011, 12, somewhere in that range, and uh, was talking to my wife about some a logo and some signage for the sign biz, uh, storage business they were going to start up, bought a property, blah, 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 that wasn't existing a business, but he was going to make it a go. And um, so she made the comment to him, like, my husband's always mentioned he wanted to do storage business. You know, that would be a cool industry to get into or whatever. Made some comment. Well, the guy called back and was like, hey, have you printed the signs yet? She's like, no. She said, hold off. I, I found something else I want to do instead. I, I think I just want to get out from underneath this property. Would y'all be interested? And so it looked at it, and it was perfect. It was 52 units, an old property that just wasn't in an active business and hadn't been for like 10 years. And so we bought that, turned it into storage unit business. It's been good for us and a good diverse option you know, to have along the way. And then um, I bought the building that we used to be uh, rent from. We bought that whole little building. So it's three different tenants. So I got a little commercial building there. Uh, we upkeep and, and, and rent out. It stays nice and rented uh, some, to some great businesses. Bought an ice house in 2020. You know, the vending machine ice houses. Um, How much paper do you have, Pete? You're going to be here a while. What? I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm about, I've got a lot of notes. I'm like, wow, this guy owns a storage unit. I'm like, okay, let's keep going about that. Let's do some research right. there. So Please. the the ice house, and I didn't even know this was a thing. Yeah, yeah so they don't have if, this. In if they're not in your area, yeah. So basically, it's like a freestanding, you know, ten by probably twenty little building structure that basically has a big ice machine in there and a big bin, and it dispenses bags of ice out. So it's an ice vending machine. Um, I always thought they were cool. Made a comment to a local guy about like, hey, do you own the machine on your property? I think that's really a neat business. And he basically was like, no, I don't own it. I just lease the property. But I know the guy who does. And next thing I know, he comes to see me in my office, like talks me into, hey, you want to buy this from me? And I was a sucker and jumped in. I thought it would be a great, you know, again, a diverse option to jump into. Um, we did start a Lufkin real estate magazine back in 2012. And it was basically, there was just not a printed publication of real estate listings in our area. Um, and that was really good. It went for a while, I think till 2017. Um, so I try, I've tried several things that didn't really take off and do much. But but yeah, as far as businesses, we still got uh, the storage unit businesses is, is good. Um, the ice house is up and down, depending how things are rolling. We love hot summers, so we sell a lot of ice during the summer. Let's see. Let's see. That's not that bad. Now I bought some businesses along the way <laughs> and merged them. I was waiting. Right. I was waiting, dude. So before I was always thinking, why would someone buy an existing business when you could start it? And I guess because I had started a few things, it just made sense of just like get it off the ground and running the way you want it. You don't have overhead of buying something, you know, pre-existing. You don't have to. I don't. Know, I just it didn't seem like a really great fit until. It was 2015. I made a little goal list. And like one of the biggest items on there and a big pain point we had was em embroidery. I uh, mean, it just continued to grow as a demand. We were outsourcing this great person locally that was doing it at our house. But again, the orders were getting bigger, more frequent. I didn't have control on pricing, turnaround times, quantity, uh, quality uh, was good. But so I just didn't have any control on any of that. So the goal was like, how do I get into embroidery, doing it ourselves? I didn't have the space. And I get a phone call early 2016, mid 2016 from a girl. And she's like, Hey, I'm calling about two things. One, my boss has an embroidery business and he's wanting to retire and sell. Um, and two, I'm going to be looking for a job soon, wondering if you'd have any work for me. And it was a, a great deal that fell into place. The guy had the, the, the Jima embroidery machines that I was researching and looking into. He had started the process of um, large format sublimation for like sport jerseys. And so we kind of had that going a little bit as a side thing he was trying to go to, but just kind of was done it for 20 years or more and was just ready to retire. And that deal was really great. So basically the money that I bought the business for, there was enough equipment and business there to pay for itself. And I rented his building until we got a bigger one a year later and it just really worked out great. Another thing that came along the way was in 2017, we had outsourced to this other local print shop for years. Um, and so they were great for like the quick things, the smaller quantities, the odd quantities, uh, just like unique projects that could always send to that East Texas printing. So, and we had talked about buying that shop for a couple of years. It just never made sense. We didn't have the space. It, the overhead, having a second location was a big thing to get overcome. 
Well, when we bought this big building room now, we had plenty of space at that time. Like we didn't know how we were going to fill it. And when the owner came over and we were just chatting, I was showing him the new space, give him a little tour. He's like, man, you've got to buy the print shop now because you could put it in this part of the building. And, you know, so he kind of opened my eyes to that. I'm like, well, crap, you're right. We could. And so we kind of worked a deal in a few months and we bought that business. He came to work with us, the whole team. We basically downsized it from a 5,000 square foot building they were in to our 3,500 square foot area we had for it. And it was great. And so again, it just fell into place. Again, we were already outsourcing to them at least a couple thousand dollars a month. So I financed a little business loan there. Again, the, the customers that followed, we were able to offer them more services then. It wasn't just about printing. Hey, who's doing your t-shirts? We'd love to do that. Uh, websites, and we were able to pick up other types of jobs from those those current customers. So that was another deal that really just worked in was great. A few years later, after that, we was embroidery. I mean, I'm sorry, engraving. We were outsourcing engraving to a girl. Did a good job, but again, we just didn't have that control. Uh, we were able to hire her and buy her business and equipment, kind of bring it under the same roof, and that helped us again go from just doing some embroidery jobs every month to just you're constantly running that in machine. So it's been really cool little things like that that have kind of fell in place. Um, So like, it's just changed my attitude to why buy an existing business and their problems and their old stuff to, it it can work out really well, just depending on, I guess, the reputation, the following and what, what you're getting. But so that's kind of helped us also, I think, grow faster in some areas instead of just getting things started and figured out, we were able to kind of start out kind of a little bit elevated up. And so it's worked. Here we are figuring it out as we go. <laughs> Here we so, are. Yeah. yeah. You've built like a miniature empire. I will say miniature. Like you, you, I mean, I'm proud you, of you it. basically it's, own the, it's not you that. own the town of Lufkin, Texas. No, sir. If there's any Lufkinites listening, they're, they're laughing right now. Like what the crap are you talking about? <laughs> but, but I am, I mean, I do want to, I, I am proud of the progress. And it's because of this great team members that's come along, you know, like I don't know, hardly anything about the print shop, but there's two great people over there that know it in and out, you know, embroidery. Like that's an area that I can't run that machine. I I understand a lot of it, but there's people over there that are passionate. They love it. They brag about, you know, how smooth these stitches came out. And, you know, it's great to see them being passionate about the areas that they're really good at. And that's allowed us to be to this point as good as we've been. So we're figuring it out, but that that's the key. Uh, So obviously the topic is, uh, and you've seen this in some of the mastermind calls and some of the, the the sign shop community for for owners that we've got, but a, a lot of people are in similar positions where they're not in a major market like Pete. Peter's probably going to pitch you a franchise after we get done here because you need to d- d- diversify your business portfolio even further. But <laughs> nevertheless, there's a, a lot of <laughs> shop owners that are in the in a similar situation where, Hey, we're not in a major market. There's, I, you know, a small ish towns, I'll, I'll say, and there could be local competition or competition from out of town. But a lot of it there is just like, how do I, how do I capture more of the market or expand? And, you know, so how do I grow in a small town? What, what would you say that your competitive advantage is like, like why would customer why are customers working with you guys? Because I, I feel like that's the like the, the crux of the issue for me. Right. No, I I think really one thing that got us off on the right foot was just a strong creative team. I think we can we do really well on the creative. Um I think constantly I'll hear good comments as far as like, I know there's plenty of other places in town that print t shirts. But your designers always just really knock it out of the park with the creative part. So I think having the creativity right is good. I mean, I for a shop our size way back when, having one or two graphic designers on the team was pretty rare when I would talk to other shops. And so, again, not that I was a genius to plan it that way. It just happened. But I think getting that design right and standing out with a great design was a big deal. And, that, and that's helped us a lot. I think another thing is embracing the community. I think we've just naturally done a good job of just supporting and being there in our community. You know, yeah, we got involved with the chamber and other resources that are in place. But I think just jumping in, like like this weekend is the lighting of Rudolph. All right, so I'm going to tell you something about Lufkin. Lufkin, uh, part of our industry don't, in our area. The what? Lot, um, hold on. The lighting of Rudolph. Okay. A lot of timber in our trees? area. Hold on. I'm going to tell you, this is unique and crazy. And I wish I had something here to show you. 
So another big industry is there's Lufkin Industries here, an old, old 100-year company, and they make oil-filled pumping units. And many, many years ago, one of the employees took one of their pumping units, it's this weird shaped structure, and um, basically made it look like a, a reindeer. Put a head on it, put lights on it, and made it and basically ro- root off the oil-filled pumping unit. And so it's a tradition in Lufkin of this. Um, this is great. This yeah, is, and so this every is year it's the lighting of Rudolph. I have a title for this episode. It, it's, it's really fun. It's really cool. Um, and so, like, one thing, again, embracing the community, we're setting up a tent next to it. We're giving away, check this, free kid tattoos, temporary tattoos that say have a Lufkin Christmas. We, are, uh, we, we designed a custom uh, coloring book. And it's like, I think, again, the same title of, like, the great Lufkin Christmas or some kind of cool title like that. And it just talks about the things that we have in our community. You know, we have an ice skating rink that's opening up for the first time this year. Um, so it's like, you know, it, we wrote this little coloring book story. Uh, we're going to give them that. And then we got these um, crayon boxes printed with our logo on it. We're giving out crayons and coloring books. Uh, so doing fun stuff like that, I think goes a long way. You know, people want to do business with people they know. And so when, when they can connect with you as people in the community, you know, it's not just a company. I think it just, it, it really helps a lot. And um, I think also just, again, having those good people on our team has built those relationships and connections with people and it's gone really far. So they're not coming into a company. They're coming to see Josh about another order. They're coming in to talk about their design with Zach because man, he, he did that logo and it's just been so great. Or he did that first vehicle wrap design for him. And, and you know, so I think that's just been really a big deal about rooting in and embracing things like that. Um, and we've done other little things that's come along the way. I remember a long time ago, there was a big deal. It was kind of silly, but something about in God, we trust stickers run all the police vehicles in our area. And there was some kind of conflict about, they didn't want to use city money to put that vinyl on the cars, you know? So we heard about it. And so we just said, we'll put vinyl on the police cars for you. And we won't charge you. It's no big deal. We can donate that. And so it was a big deal. And, we made stickers and then people are coming saying, Hey, can I get a, another one of those in God we trust stickers for my personal vehicle? And we made them like crazy one year. And it was just, you know, just kind of serving the community and something relevant at the time. And it was really cool for us because we made a lot of connections throughout that uh, as well. So I think just being open to what's going on and jumping in where you can and giving back is going to go a long way. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to hold this up. I'm not sure if you guys can read it. It says luck. Like I heard you talking about all the the businesses that you bought, right? And I I don't I don't remember where I heard this idea of like your luck surface area. Maybe on a podcast, maybe some book that I read. But like it's good to think about luck is not like luck. It like hey, it just it's gonna happen, just like coincidence. It's about like moving and being out there. And when you do that, when you participate in your community you're increasing that luck surface area. So if I've got more surface area that we cover, oh, hey, lightning can strike here, there, here, there. And like listening to you talk about all these different businesses that you bought, and it's just like, oh, it just happened to do that. I feel like you're downplaying it, obviously, uh, honestly. Like, hey, like, it's like, oh, this this happened, and this happened, this just walked in at the perfect time, you know, and that's looking back at it. Maybe it seems that way, but to me, like listening to you talk, like I, I'm seeing a pattern. I'm not sure if you're seeing the same kind of pattern, Pete, where it's like, Hey, we run into a challenge or like, Hey, we, we outsource a product. Things are going great for a while. We kind of overwhelm that particular outsourcer or we need more control. And then it's just like, okay, like, Hey, we're going to bring that into the fold. And that's, it seems like that's the the strategy that you guys have employed successfully. Yeah. Appreciate you saying that. I mean, but I, you got to put in the time, you know I mean? Like you could look and say like, man, I wish my business would fall in place like real graphics did, but like, dude, we busted it and we put in the time. And so I think maybe that hard work kind of aligns with opportunity and that's where that intersection of luck comes in, but you got to hustle it and work it, you know, to make it happen. And it's not been easy, but yeah, it's, it's worked out free kids tattoos i love it man the the what is it rudolph the light the rudolph the oil field it's really like rudolph the pumping unit um pumping unit okay yeah but the pumping unit is like an oil field type product thing um 
So, and the other thing I think really is training and getting a really good team underneath you, because I do feel for some of the sign shop guys that it's, they're still the core of it, you know, and I know they're just wearing thin, running hard. And like, if, if they're sick or there's something that goes on, like there's so much that doesn't get done because of that. And that's a tough load to carry. And I think everyone has to carry it for a season, but I think quick as you can, you know, is to train up the people that can carry those loads. And if they're out, there's another person to help. Is it a Boy Scout thing or an, an army military thing of one is none, two is one or something like that? You know, like that's kind of true. Like if you've got one one person that can do that and if they leave or they're out, you're in trouble. And that's one thing that we're constantly facing and still facing now is just what happens when that one person leaves and they knew this much stuff that no one else knew, it could put you in a bind. Uh, and it has. So I'm not talking like we have that figured out, but those are some pain points. So I just hope sign shop owners can try to start investing in their team and building them up and getting the right people in places because you need them. You really do. You're not going to be able to keep up with everything forever. What was that transition like for you? Because, you know, now I know you're still, you're, you're still very involved in the business and the community, but you're not, a, you know, like if, if you take two or three days off, I, I'm assuming things run just fine. Like it's, it's yeah. not the end of the world. And I know that's, that's a different case for a lot of, sign shop owners that are, are in small towns is like, Hey, I, if I walk away from the, the shop for two days, like something bad's going to happen or we're going to have to shut the doors or, you know, even if you're just running into a situation like I'm in this week, like, Hey, if yeah. hey, my wife and kids are at home sick and I've got to be there to take care of them, like, you know, are things going to run smoothly? So you know, maybe speak a little bit about like that transition for you. Like what year was that where you, in the business where you kind of like, Hey, I got to make this. And you know, what were some of the pain points that you had as you went through it? Please don't think I got this figured out, but I don't think I've got, I'm kind of a control person, but I don't think I'm terrible on letting things go. So like, I'm, I'm okay with like releasing the reins and saying, Hey, you focus on this. So I think naturally that's kind of been a part of my connection with the team. It's just, you know, letting you do your thing. And then maybe I might coach you along the way. So I think gradually there's been a, a fair bit of empowering and letting other people do things that, you know, I think maybe, Oh, I could probably do that better, but Hey, I need you to learn and grow in that area. So that's kind of happened along the, on the way. And I think again, helped us a lot, but man, it just, you do carry so much as a, an owner or founder or, or even the leader of a company. And man, it kind of led to some burnout for me uh, in 2020, just started really struggling with different things in a different way, you know, where it was just, it was really wearing on me in 2021 it, it was just kind of hit me at some breaking points of just like, man, I got to make some changes because there was a lot of those things where that custom quote is waiting on me, that special project that I, I'm going to have to figure some out, you know, is waiting on me. And it was just always that if I don't get this done, it's not getting done. And there was a lot that would bottleneck at me. And so I, again, just reached out to some team members and like, man, I need some help and I need y'all to kind of carry. And my operations manager now just really stepped up to help. That was like, the lifesaver of it, because then now I don't have the same feeling of that customer's waiting on me directly. I still need to lead. I still need to set you know goals and problem solve and, and use my skills in, in those areas. But it's not on the daily of like, yes, if I was sick tomorrow, everyone could run this place just the same and we're going to be fine. And so I kind of did an analogy talk with the team about, you know, we built from just this little one man boat, you know, where we could scoot along and get things done. And I was figuring it out as we went. We're quick to navigate and turn and pivot and do what we needed to do to you know, grow. And then we kind of got to be a little bigger ship, needed more team members involved. And then I told them, like, now we're, we're more of a bigger vessel that we need departments. We need someone in the engine room. We need someone, you know, doing these different areas and doing them well. And I said, I've been here trying to keep my hand on the steering wheel, you know, keep, keep us, you know, afloat is what we kind of, a term we use a lot during that COVID season. And as I told him, I was like, well, I'm tired of just keeping afloat. Like if we're going to be going forward, we want to be growing forward. And so that's been our theme since then. This last year was we're growing forward. I don't want to be afloat maybe, anymore. Maybe that's the episode title right there. Well, it's just been the truth of like where I was. And like I think a lot of the team was just like, you know, I don't want to 
have the same struggles month after month. And so let's make changes to, to, to be growing forward. I can't stop saying it. And, um, but you know <laughs> what I told my team is like, I need to get my hand off the steering wheel on the daily things and move up to the, the lookout tower and figure out where we're going, how we're going to get there. You know, let's get a growth mentality and let's put processes and things in place that we need to be a, a more of a firm, solid foundation. And, you know, I pointed Melissa like, Hey, she's going to be having her hands on the steering wheel now and y'all support her. And so as a team, we just evolved a lot. September a year ago uh, is kind of where that started. And it's just been a new chapter for us. We are not out of the woods. We are still post-COVID struggles and every month has got different challenges. So it is not free sailing at all. But that, as an owner, that's where things really changed for me because I was just, man, I was, it was struggle. You know, it was tough. Like putting your hand on the door to walk into work was just like, Something I didn't realize what it was, but it was anxiety of just like, oh, I don't know what's about to hit me. I don't, you know, I had a great morning, you know, but I don't know what's about to happen. So that's kind of the point I got to. And thankfully things were able to change and my team was there to really help spread some of that load out. And it's been a different world for me now. All right. So let, 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 let's kind of take that and run with it here. You know, we got a lot of listeners out there that are going to love your story and love how you got started. But now that you're you're seasoned, right? You've been doing this a long time. This is your this is your baby. This is your shop. Still working on the time aspect like you said. What can they take from this? What what processes? I'm going to put you on the spot here, Chris. Maybe something that Bryant here has helped you with, so I don't know. But what processes have you put in place for your shop, for your shop size that our listeners might be able to get benefit from? Man, the last year has been a lot of exploring what are the steps we need to take to be more solid. I'm not the best implementer. I'm not the best at carrying things out. Bryant has come along as a consultant, but also as a doer and put some things in place for us, uh, things in Shopbox that's been really helpful. Bringing up pain points and brainstorming with him on like, okay, this is a problem we're getting wrong a lot. What's going to be a better flow for that? But I will say a struggle just honestly has been just the overwhelming wideness. And again, I think of a lot of it's because this the wideness of our shop abilities, because it's like, I feel like every department needs so much attention. And I have felt like my attention and my energies have been spread by like what problem is the loudest today. So I will say as a failure that I have not mastered yet is focusing in like this part needs to be better. Let's get it and move on to this area. Um, so I'm trying to do that. Brian has helped me. Like we jumped in and tackled a lot of apparel products in Shopbox that were just wonky and kind of, you know, and we focus like, Hey, let's get these five really main products we use and let's get them really good. So my sales reps are smoother. Production will get better information and so on. And so like that little improvement we focus on for a month or two really has made a good change of uh, difference. So I do envy someone that maybe it's just a sign shop or apparel shop that could like laser focus and maybe get more accomplished quicker because I constantly feel like I get pulled to, okay, now paper printing prices are a problem and paper's out of stock and prices keep shooting up. We've got to recalculate that. And so I need to shift my attention there and help kind of dive in on that spot. So, uh, so that's not something I've mastered. That's something I'm trying to work on. Uh, it's almost like the one-stop shop approach is kind of like a double-edged sword. Like it's, it's like, it's great for growth because and we went through the same thing in our shop. Like we were in a small town. We did printing. We did large format. We did signs. We did screen printing. We did embroidery. We did wraps. You know, we did it all. A lot of it we did under one roof. A lot of it we would outsource. You know, our mix was different. It was probably like 60, 40, 70, 30, you know, 70% in house, 60% in house. But, you know, when you have that many products and that, I'll go back to that word surface area. When you've got all that surface area to cover, it's a lot, especially, and, you know, even, even at 25 employees, that's, you know, if you've got five, six different departments, that's, you know, it's still not a lot per department to no, you know, no. run essentially what's its own business unit. And I will say like with team wise, I mean, the goal would be to be real cross train. So that way if, this person's out sick. Hey, we can pull this person from this department to help fill in. We haven't mastered that, but we, we try to let people train in all departments just to get an idea so that if they needed to fill in, it would be an option. But again, every department is pretty signage probably has six or eight people. Um, apparel has three or four. A print shop has two to maybe two and a half if there's someone else helping. Um, and then sales reps, there's usually about three to four primary sales reps, and then designers, about five or six 
uh, normal. We've got one web guy, keeps our digital stuff going. So there's not a lot in every department. It's not like a mass team. So sign production stuff, yard signs and banners, there's mainly two people that are keeping those things going. So if one's out, there's another. But if you need a third set of hands, we got to rob from somewhere to help. So that's kind of the flow of our team and how that kind of looks. But yeah, so I think getting those things in place, uh, one thing, if I could do it different and if I would have known that, hey, this is how we're going to look like in five or 10 years, I think laying a foundation of those procedures and processes and, and, and a training structure, we would be a different company today. You know, if we had the standard, you know, because right now, if we get a new person, our training isn't isn't very structured. So they get trained this month differently than someone got trained nine months ago, you know, just because of the work on, on hand or what's going on. And so... That's tough. So I think if I could do it again, getting th- more firm things in place on a, like a foundational level would really help us a lot better. And I, but I feel I mean, like that's always a, a tough one, though, because it's like... Changes. Yeah, yeah, it changes. And it's, it's very fluid. New machine, new process. And, and that's one thing. I mean, we do have a few things in place of, of standard operating procedures that are have been pretty crucial, but it is kind of funny sometimes. It's like, no, we don't save PDFs anymore. We have to save an EPS for that new program, for this new printer, or the RIP software takes the... It's just, there's always those tweaks along the way that it's like, you didn't get the memo? <laughs> you know, so we have that struggle often, but yeah, trying to keep everybody on the same page and trained in the same way is a balancing act we're trying to work on. And I think a lot of the problems we make are from lack of training. You know, from the sales rep taking an order in a certain way, you know, if they would have been trained a little bit deeper to understand our routing abilities or to understand, you know, know that PVC sign doesn't weather outside well, they wouldn't have sold it that way. We had a job the other day get laminated coroplast. And I'm like, why are we laminating coroplast sign? You know, and like, well, the customer, you know, we were talking and, and I told him the lamination, you know, protects from scratches and that way their, their, their yard sign doesn't get lamin- uh, scratched. I was <laughs> like, oh gosh, you know, it's like, like yeah. Tra- training, you know, is, is a key. And then like, I was also talking to the, the production team about like, did y'all not question why we're laminating yard signs? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, we just thought it was weird, but we were just getting the order done. It said it and said it on the order sheet. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Fun stuff, man. Yeah. So going back to like Pete's question about like the process changes, like, like what. Like, what's one change that you've got, like, one specific change that you've made? Like, I, I don't want to hear the stuff that we worked on together because that's boring. I, I mean, it's it's cool, but it's, you know, it's boring for the context of this one. Like, what's what's one big change or a, a specific change? It doesn't have to be a big change that's made, like, a big impact for you on the business or, you know, as an owner that you guys have done over the last year or two? I'm telling you, I, I've struggled with nailing that question with a great answer. But I, another thing that's like another work in progress is trying to create a little bit of levels of leadership because for a while it was me and then a lot of team members. And then we kind of did have a couple department leads um, that could kind of help take on some stuff. So I think one thing we're working on that's still kind of work in progress is trying to kind of put these good leaders in place at different levels. So that way they're your go-to. So when, you know, when a production team member has a struggle with this, they know, hey, let me go talk to this person. Okay, we're still having a problem. Then let's go to this manager. And again, usually that was me. And now that would be Melissa. And then Melissa, if there's still a problem that they haven't overcome or we need a special troubleshoot, hey, I'm happy to get involved and help. But that has helped a lot because my day would be hijacked, you know, and I know a lot of owners have to relate to you had a plan to something you were about to do for the next two hours. And and that's out the window because you're you're trying to fix a printer or something else. So to have more people, you know, not under you, but just in, in, in line that can help, I think would go a long way and protect the owner's attention and, and focus a little bit better. So we're trying to do that. I think another thing goes to proper delegation, you know, because like a guy told me a really great acronym for delegation and I just, I've loved it. I can't regurgitate it right now, but it basically was like different levels of, you know, there's going to be someone that comes to you, hey, what do I do with this? And you're going to say, go and do this. Exactly. Then there's going to be another one where it's like, what do you think we should do? Okay, that's a good one. Why don't you try that? Let me know how it goes. Another level of, hey, I think you can figure it out. Go and figure it out. Try whatever you think's best and let me know how it turns out. And then there's that final level of go figure it out. I trust you. You got it. Don't even tell me how it turns out because I know you're going to take care of it. Working down that path, you know, and so I think 
it's easier just like, oh, just let me fix it and get it done. You're not letting that person grow at all. You're, you know, they're not going to grow. The next time that problem comes up, it's coming right back to you again. So if you can start working with that team member as far as with those different levels and building trust and confidence in them, because I've had a lot of people say like, oh, I didn't want to make that call because I didn't want to, you know, make the wrong, wrong move or I didn't want to mess that up. And I'm like, you know what? I'd rather you mess that up and let's figure something out. So that way next time you're that much more prepared. So I think trying to come constantly build up your team in that way could be a big help going forward. So that way I'm not bombarded with so many service level things that you should have been able to figure that out on your own. I'm building them up in confidence and they know that, you know, and then they might report back, Hey, I did try this. It didn't work, but I did this. It worked. You know, just letting you know. And I love that. Hey, thanks for keeping me in the loop. Glad you figured it out. Glad that printer's back going. Glad that customer's happy with the fix or whatever it be. I think that's good because I do think just knowing a lot, some other sign shop owners, they make that final decision every day. Everything has to go to them. That's tough. That's tough. Yeah. I, I love that four levels of delegation thing. I've, I've not heard it phrased like that, but yeah, it definitely resonates with me hundred yeah. percent. Like, Hey, you got a, like when somebody starts out there, you don't give them a lot of leeway or mm-hmm. you can't. And there's some people that jump in at like a different level of that, you know, like, Hey, your operations manager is coming in at like, Hey, you, you've already done, something similar in a different position, like now you're going to step in and I'm going to hand some of the reins off to you, but you know, I still have to make sure we're effectively communicating and a kind of high level strategy stuff. So yeah, I, I definitely like that. that well, here's idea. another thought too, though, that I think I've been guilty of, and I, I try to consciously not do it is kind of like jumping your ranks as far as me going to a, a production team member and tell them to do something one way when Maybe someone else had already said, you know what I mean? Like, respect that. Well, hey, what did Melissa tell you to do? Okay, then, you know, go back to that. Let's go. Well, hey, did you already talked to Melissa about this. Okay, go see what she thinks. If y'all need help, come let me know, you know? And keeping that order in place is, is very healthy because we've had that happen where team member wants to just jump straight to me and then you've got to kind of reiterate. Well, cool. Did you already troubleshoot that with the with the department lead? Then y'all go talk about it. I bet you could figure that out. If not, let Melissa know. I bet she could, you know what I mean? And just keeping that in check and kind of training the team to, to lean on one another, I think would be another, I really think good thing to get, get down in that process of delegation. Cause I think it's too easy for the sign shop owner or, or even a manager to come in and just kind of override something that, a you know, someone else had already put in place and, and that you lose authority that, you know, they're, they're going to think, why do I even bother going to that person? Right. And Chris is going to tell me something different anyway, you know, so try not to make those mistakes. Like I said, I know I've done it and I've tried to be cautious of not overriding that some, something that someone else has already. It takes a lot about. of self-awareness to, to catch yourself doing that. I mean, I, I'm guilty of it in the past as well. Like, Hey, like, Oh, I'm going to jump in and oh, I'm going to take this one. Don't worry about it. I got yeah. it. So I try not to. So yeah, anyway, so any sign shop owners, man, try to get out of that daily stuff as quick as you can, not because you're, you want to avoid it, but just because then you can focus on those bigger picture things. You can make sure that we're firing in on all cylinders and everybody's supported and been good because if I'm just taking customer orders, we're never going to get really past that, you know, this level. We're not going to grow where we potentially can and should. And Or you're going to be like me. And I think for many years, I just neglected a lot of the foundational things I needed in place, you know, so we probably could be a lot healthier as a company than we are now, but a lot of things were kind of loosey goosey and just winging it along the way. Now, another thing that Brian, you helped get in place in 2019 was the connection to the print CFO guys, uh, Tyler and Brian. Like, man, that was a game changer for us because I had an accountant. Yeah, my taxes were good and my books were somewhat balanced, but these guys came in and started dialing in my margins and my departments and, you know, where's my labor cost going, not just in general, but to each area. And those types of things were really, really big. Big yeah. yeah, that's Not a big. Uh, that's that's one that I've I've talked to a lot of shop owners about. Is like you think that a like your typical CPA accountant, like they just want to do your taxes. Honestly, like hey, I just want to make sure you're compliant with the government. And I did, but, you know? but, but 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 like the expectation from like the business owner side, or even and, and I was guilty of this too when I started my own business was my accountant's going to be involved and give me advice on what I should do here. Should I buy that equipment or, you know, what, what are we going to project sales at for next year? So can I hire somebody? And that's a really like, that's not the job of an accountant. 
No, if you, if you find that, wow. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you're right. I would have loved to have that along the years. Like that would have been great, but no. Yeah. yeah so definitely so, plug so, for those guys. We'll so those team members, uh, yeah, that Tyler's was, link in the, the show. Man, notes. That, that's been a game changer. And they've been right about a lot. Like, hey, Chris, you're going to run low on cash in next month. And, you know, it's like, yep, they were right. You know, they, they, they could see the trends. They were helping me notice things. And they have also identified problems as far as just even in our bookkeeping of this margin's not right. If you're selling it for this and your labor's, you know, and we found some things out of place and fixed it. And so it's been really cool to collaborate with those guys. Awesome. It, it seems like you don't have any problem whatsoever, like, or any ego in like, hey, somebody else is can figure this out and like letting that giving that person the space to do it. Like you said, you've done that with your team, your operations manager with Tyler and the guys at Print CFO. Like, was there was there ever a time where you were like maybe in the at the start of the business where you were wound a little held on a little tighter? Or is that just like a muscle that you've developed? Like, hey, let's call that a muscle. That's a good way to put it. Because, yeah, I mean, everyone has that. I don't even know if it would be ego driven, but more just like control nurturing, you know, like, hey, I was the only one doing this. And if you're not doing it that same way, you know, you could start having problems or, you know, and someone could have a little ego as far as like, that's not the way I showed you to do it. But to be open to see like, hey, you know what, that does make sense. Let's adapt and start doing it that way and taking others ideas. I, whatever you can do to empower other team members, I think's the goal because I can't be in all departments at once. So if they have the idea... Chris would do it like this and they can evolve and make it better. That's, that's awesome. Another quote that I've heard my pastor say, and I love is like, you produce what you reiterate, you keep what you celebrate and you deserve what you tolerate. And that's been so true. So when we find a team member doing something right, let's praise that. Let's encourage that. Let's celebrate that. Hey, that is exactly how we want to do it. You know, let's produce what we reiterate. Let's reiterate the important things. Hey, because our customer matters, we do not want to let this go out. Or because this might be a problem, let's go ahead and run that by the customer. Let's not surprise them with the change or, you know, whatever it be. Reiterate those things so that way our team knows to make the right decision in that right way. And when it does not go right, whenever it's like, what were they thinking? Usually we can look at that situation and say, you know what? We kind of deserve it because we've tolerated this for so long. When that happens or that attitude comes out, it's because we've let it get sloppy in that area. And so I've also kind of embraced that little saying and, and, and tried to use that to, again, empower the team. And I think another thing we could kind of even mention as a big deal is creating opportunity in your team, because you're always going to have just staff members if they're just there to do a task or a job. But if there's opportunities for them to dial in, and I've heard you guys talk about this on a recent podcast, and I think that's really important, including your team members in and the decisions. Hey, why do you guys think this was a problem? What can we do different? Involving their opinions, I think it's awesome. I mean, it makes them feel valued, but also shows that they are valuable. And from there, you're probably going to get some really good ideas to move forward. So creating those opportunities. And then also we try to create opportunities in our pay scale. So like our production team, we put something in place a few years ago to where they are paid a production bonus on as they work. I didn't, I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm glad you brought it up because I, I, I it's not the norm. I definitely want to dive into it. Well, it so. was, there was another company in town that is amazing and we, we work for them a lot, but also glean really great ideas from them. And one of the things that they put in place was for their service technicians, they were paid kind of almost as their own little business owners of their truck, you know, and hey, they created opportunities for them to earn more. And, you know, as they made more efficient moves, they could you know generate more income. And we love that idea. So we adapted it in a small way of just, okay, hey, you're, you're getting paid to show up and do your quality job and give us your, you know, your, your excellent work. But on top of that, here's a production bonus that comes every month by the work you produce. So if we have a callback, we have a problem, we got to reprint, that amount of funds goes out of the budget. Like You're not going to bonus on that shirt order because we had this problem or we missed a deadline. Quality was maybe not to par. We gave a discount. You know, So that could get disqualified from that. But if everything went great, customer's happy, we hit the deadline, we got 10 orders done this week instead of eight, You know, they're receiving a small percentage of those jobs per team. Um, it also kind of creates the teamwork of like, hey, the screen printing department, they want to crank out these orders together because we been, we, but they bonus off the same amount. Uh, sales reps, the order, the reason they want to crank those orders in and make sure they're going through production smoothly and correctly is because they get a percentage on all the orders that they put through Shopbox, things like that. So again, we don't have it perfected, but that is something we put in place with the hopes that our team would have 
opportunity to, you know, their paycheck could reflect the hard work they're putting in. And they would also feel a little pain of like, man, we messed up and that big shirt order. I didn't make a bonus off that because we had to reprint or we had to fix or discount or whatever. So that's something I hope to grow. Again, what's, what stunk is we, we launched it in January 2020. January 2020 was one of our best months. February was one of our second best months. In March, everything kind of came crumbling. And so we kept that in place this time, even though profits are not what we near had hoped. It's been more of survival mode since. But we kept it in there because it's just important, I think, for the team to have a feeling of kind of ownership in their work and their ability. And we, we try to preach to like, hey, you're not coming to do a job. You're coming to bring value to the company. Um, so don't just come to be here, but be engaged. Leave empty. Leave knowing, man, I, I gave some quality work today. I poured into this project or that. I brought my skills, my, you know, my creativity, right? Whatever their role is, you know, like I want them to feel proud of what they leave and proud when they see that sign on the wall or the truck driving down the road or whatever it be, you know, like, and so anyway, we want to try to celebrate those things with them and create the opportunities that they can learn and grow and like doing what they're doing. So that's something we've tried to do constantly. But but also like back to the creating opportunities, we've had several team members move to different places. Like we had one guy that started as a helper right out of, well, he wasn't even out of college. He was on academic probation from college from <laughs> slacking around a little bit, came in as a, as a helper, you know, really great hard worker. Then he started working on a production team. Then he was our kind of our lead sign production guy for a year or two, but he always wanted to be a graphic designer. Uh, that's what he started to go to school for. And so we made efforts to move this valuable team member from one role to a creative role because that was kind of where his passion was. We had another guy that also was in signage and was a super great installer, and super great operator leader in that area, but he's super creative and he did great video editing for church and different things. He had these skills. And so we painfully you know, try to navigate him away from that and got him in a creative role where he could, you know, use his gifts and talents better. So I think just wanting the best for your people is another big thing because we've made some painful moves that I wish that person was still in that role, but they thrive over there and that's good uh, for them as well. I think that's important. So moving people around, I think has been, another, I mean, again, not everyone can, I mean, some people just, I need you there, so stay there for a while. But when we can, we try to like get them opportunities to, to change it up and do different things. And I think that helps keep them engaged. And that way, it's not just a job. This is opportunity. It's my career. This is, you know, I'm a valuable team member. I'm needed here. And hopefully they can be yeah. and do the best. I, I love that approach that you mentioned career, right? Like a lot of, a, like, a, not the owner or manager, but like a lot of the production employees probably are, are calling this a a job in other shops and you're trying to instill that, Hey, there's something bigger than we're working on here. And this is a, a career for you guys. So Pete, I'm gonna open the floor for you, dude, because I know you got like a couple, I know you've been sitting on like a pointed question or two before we wrap this thing up. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, I was really enjoying everything that Chris was saying. So I wanted to let him kind of, as I like to say, ramble on a little bit, but <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> you, you covered a lot of really great topics. I think the 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 biggest question for me it, it is not going to be something that I think is going to be hard for you to answer, but like, what do you see your how how do you see yourself in terms of time? Like, if you had time, where where is your time best used in your life in your businesses right now? I learned from a there was a little seminar is that and they they it's kind of like personality profiles, but they were talking about different know your area of strengths and and run in that and. Part of that was this visionary and I, they called it something else. It was like a visionary profile. And then there was like a manager operator, someone who implements things. And then there were a couple of others. And I totally identified with that visionary one. And again, I'm sometimes that term seems a little cocky, but I am a good idea guy. So when you got a problem it's in our shop, I mean, in my, in our little area, I love coming out with the problem solve of that. You know, Hey, you know what? This is it. You've already tried this. You've already tried that. I do love kind of tackling some of those special things like that. And I think I'm can bring value to the company in that type of area. I think setting big goals is a big part of it. You know, like if we can, I mean, like we're going to stay doing what we're doing unless someone cast out this new idea. Hey, wh what if we in five years had this going on or a different location or whatever? So I hope that I can find my time wisely to navigate us towards bigger things and new ideas because that will keep the team gener generally more excited and engaged because 
yeah, I mean, like everyone's going to kind of get dull by doing the same routine. But yeah, okay. We... So, so, so you're more of a visionary. You want to explore those opportunities, kind of solidify those cracks before they become deterrents yeah. in the future, right? Take uh, risks. And, and the only reason why you could do that, and the ob- it's an obvious statement, but the only reason you could do that is because you're not in your business. You're working on your business. You are the leader, the coach, the consultant, the trainer. Those are areas where I'm hearing, and you may not be saying them, but Based off of what you've said, I'm making really great assumptions that this is where your expertise lies. As a shop owner, your responsibility is not designing or quoting or selling or even installing or fabricating. It's more training, guiding, consulting, looking for those areas of weakness and then shoring up those inefficiencies. You know, I'm speaking to a I was speaking to a specific sign shop or a new sign shop owner earlier this week. Who is quite the opposite of you, Chris? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mention his name or, or his shop, but he just bought this business from a from an experienced sign shop owner who is very involved in the system. Very involved. In fact, everything was up here. He had told me that all of his pricing was listed on laminated sheets. And I'm like, oh, dude, like we need to fix this problem. You know, let me ex- let me introduce you to like a shop management tool. And, you know, you have side shop owners out there, Chris. Let, like, let's not forget that we all started this way. This gentleman is just coming in and learning everything about this industry. He doesn't know how to make signs. He doesn't know how to design signs. And when I'm talking to him and I'm working through all of those uh, building blocks Right. One of the things that always comes back in our conversations is that you have to build the foundation. You have this is what you're going to build the engine. You're you're gonna build your engine, no matter who you sell this to or who gets hired, or hey, if you want to go on a two-week vacation, no matter what happens, the engine is always capable of running. And that is what People are now building their shops on. So that's what I like when I'm listening to you is that you've built this engine. You've you didn't start this way, right? Mm -hmm. You 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 said it yourself. You know, you made that that first poster for twenty five dollars because you said, "Hey, yeah, sure, I can use an extra couple of bucks." For me, hearing your story, learning a little bit more about how you kind of grew into this, making it fun, uh, making it exciting, but most importantly building the foundation, building your, you've built your engine. In fact, one might say that your engine is built and Bryant is helping you supercharge that engine, right? Like you're adding all sorts of tweaks to it because you continue to be involved in the business enough where you can explore those inefficiencies to make that engine better. So when I asked you earlier about like what processes you have, like that's all part of the engine. That's all part of it. You know, one might say you built the system. What does an engine need? It needs gasoline to run. So that in my mind, that's marketing, right? So what does a shop do of your size marketing wise to attract its customers? That's a question I'd like uh, that I wanted to ask. I kind of took the long way to ask it. No, but, uh, thanks for the recap. I mean, you really did say that right. And uh, you're right. But yeah, you know, you need every engine needs gasoline. Every engine needs gas to run, right? So we look at that in marketing dollars and marketing ideas. So what uh, for a shop your size, what are you doing to attract new business? So mine's going to be having a solid presence presence online. A lot of those foundational things are in place, right? But we're not super aggressive there because luckily for so far all the business that we've grown from has come in the front door, called us, or emailed us. So we haven't really gone out and asked for a lot of work. So that's what energizes me to think, what are the possibilities out there if we went out to actually ask for more work? We actually like pursue some leads. We followed up with existing and older customers and asked them, hey, we'd love to have your shirt business. And we're not doing any of that right now. So I think for the future of us to have an outside sales point person would be a pretty cool, powerful team member to add in the future. But for now, we are just managing the stuff coming in, which, again, I don't want it to sound in the wrong way because we're super grateful, but like, what a blessing to have plenty of work coming in that we've continued to grow every year. I haven't fueled a lot of gasoline on the fire for that, but we've got, we have stayed consistent there. Yes, I'm going to have some Google ads running. We've ran a billboard just for fun before. We have our wrap vehicles that are out there, and that constantly brings us great attention. I mean, I was, I was pumping gas the other day, and I got in one of our, I was in one of our work vehicles, and it just, the guy just starts chatting to me about his business and all this. And I'm just thinking like, what other 
opportunity would come this way if you did not have that rap vehicle there that he's not only talking about wanting to wrap his construction company truck, but y'all print business. I mean, it's just brings so much opportunity. So our rap vehicles have been a great help to stay in the area and relevant. I love it whenever I get comments of like, man, I saw you guys in this truck way out in Jasper yesterday. What are y'all doing out there? And so it's been good seeing those on the street and and, and you know, kind of keeping people in. Yeah. Thinking of us uh, to, to, the, to that community. point. To that point, I always talk to my I always talk to my uh, my consultant, my clients that I consult with, my sign shop owners that I consult with, and I always bring up that story. We actually talk. It was a. Uh, I'm not sure if the episode is out yet, but that episode that we did about raps with um, Bryant Dana Antonelli. Yeah, thank you. Couldn't recall his name, Dan Antonelli. When we really, I was, I was like, oh man, this is gonna be my jam right here because I can't wait to think. I was just thinking about this story. I had a little shop, right? I just got started my first year, and my father, he says, Pete, you need a billboard. He says, here's a nine hundred dollar van I found on Craigslist. You should just wrap it. Just wrap it and park it on the side of your building and watch what would happen. I'll never forget that. This is like That's before wraps awesome. became like a, a thing. You know, like almost every shop cut has. Vinyl layered up, or no, was it a, no, 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 no. It was a real wrap. wrap. It was okay. a real wow. wrap. It was a real wrap. But before wraps were like they were today, yeah, right? Yeah. Like almost every shop does wraps now. I still remember the very first wrap I've ever done, which was like I remember jumping up for joy. Like, I've got a wrap. Yeah, <laughs> you know, somebody gave me five thousand dollars to do a wrap. You know, I still remember that to like it was like it was yesterday, but. The importance for those shops out there that are not looking at it like this, like that's a really simple way of just branding yourself, right? Keep a truck parked right outside, maybe park it on the side of a, a building, an intersection, a, an empty or yep. a deserted parking lot, and just keep it there. Park it there. Get your name out there. It's a really simple way of attracting, I wouldn't even say new business. It's just a way of getting the brand out there, brand awareness, right? Like keeping your brand consistent. They drove past it on Main Street. Now they're driving down Douglasville Road or whatever you want to call your road on. And now they see your shop. That's two touch points, right? So doing something just like that, it's a really great tip for the small sign shop owner, the small guys that are out there that are like doing 250 to $500,000 a year in sales that are looking for like added ways of, of really trying to get, you know, the brand out there. Maybe they don't want to spend $500 a month on, I don't know, Google a billboard ads. advertising, right. no, Google, you know, yeah. but if you spent, uh, if you spent $900 and did it yourself and wrapped your own vehicle, that's going to last a lifetime. That's going to, well, maybe not a lifetime, but you know, it's going to last yeah. a lot longer than a, than a monthly ad in a magazine or, you know, a diner ad, a billboard for a couple of weeks. I mean, even Brian knows you can advertise in like magazines and maybe the impressions are not great. Yeah. You know, maybe there's some digital magazines out there that want your advertising, but they suck, you know? So where, where is your money best, best being spent? You know, I mean, for, the, for us seasoned sign shop guys, we've advertised everywhere, right? We've, we've done the diner mats. We've done the sponsorships of the little leagues. We've yep. done the sponsorships on the light up your Rudolph event. Okay. We're, do, we're handing out little things. I remember, I still remember one of my first trade shows. I routed out over 500 corrugated plastic guitars to hand out, you know, like just to people like, give me, give me, give me. Yeah, that's awesome yeah. guitars. But it was just a cut out piece of coral. It was, it was cool looking, but people would recognize you. And I can't, and I sold franchises that way. So there's so many things that a sign shop owner can do to pour gasoline into their engine. But Chris, I'm bringing this right back to you. And my last question here, and, and please, I'm going to caution you. If you could be specific, Okay. For those listeners, I mean, I'm going to ask you a pretty simple question, but be specific. Give them a tip. Help them out here. Let's be let's be really great sign shop owners here and and pass along some really great advice for that next sign shop owner. You got a great system built of processes, right? You mentioned you use Shopbox. You have you do some marketing, right? Here's the question: When a lead comes in, okay, when a lead comes in of any kind, no, doesn't matter how. Tell our listeners what happens in your shop. Who answers the lead? How does it get processed? How quickly do you turn into an estimate? Walk us through the front end of your process 
so our listeners can learn a little bit of something, how to do it in, correctly in their shop? Well, figure things out. But right now, yeah, if, you, if, if a website order comes in, we try to be there and, you know, order could come in through Facebook or any kind of online deal. It funnels through a couple of email accounts we have ready. So that way we know kind of how it came in. So yes, yeah, front desk will receive it, share it with a sales rep, just kind of depending on who would be best fit. Uh, then they'll reach back out make connection. Hey, how can we prepare a quote? What are these details? Uh, we also have five, and I don't mind sharing this, but I have five top questions that our sales reps kind of run through. Um, it's basically, and I've heard y'all kind of mention some of this stuff. It's like talking about budget, talking about time frame, talking about scope of work, you know, expectations, how, you know, how long we want this to last. Gathering those top five things would let them give the best educated quote. Generally, we're going to give them a good, better, best, or at least a good and better option. Um, so sometimes they might ask for a core blast sign, but by the time we kind of retrieve the goal of it, what's it for, it might evolve to something different. And so hopefully we give that customer, hey, this is what you asked for. Maybe here's even a better option if you want it to last a little longer. Or hey, yes, our, our basic t-shirts start at six bucks a piece. But if you are wanting one of those fashion tees that are tri-blend that people really don't want to take off, here's an option that costs this much. Um, so hopefully we provide those options in pricing, pass it then from there, we get the order go through the deposit step, assign it to a design team member to provide the mock-ups. Um, and then from their approval, it gets assigned a dip production due date and passed into the production stage state to go down that flow. So that's kind of the flow. So hopefully we're fielding that well. Again, I don't think we have it perfect, but man, to lose a lead is so bad. I mean, that one person is going to be disappointed and they're going to tell way more people than that happy customer that was taken care of. So it's very important to make sure we're receiving it because if not, we're wasting all that. We, we, we wrap that vehicle. We, we sponsor that little league ad and all this stuff to get this, this opportunity and we missed it. And so I just feel like we had to be good stewards of those opportunities and do it well. And that's kind of why we haven't really ventured out to ask for more work is because we're still trying to make sure we polish and take care of these customers that are coming in. We also run a 25% repeat customer rate, which is great. I'd love to see that grow and that I'd love to just nurture those accounts better, nurture those customers, reach back out. Hey, how was your experience? I think there's opportunities that we have to do that better that I'd love to see us grow in, but we've got to you know, receive that well. Because one of the worst things we get is people say about other places, well, I reached out, I never got a quote or they did, they showed up and surveyed, but they never came back and gave me some options or didn't call me back or whatever. And that's something I don't want people to say about us. So we've got to do everything we can to not, be one of those that they're telling the shop down the road. <laughs> those guys never got back with me and that's terrible. So we are doing our best, but we've been blessed with a lot of work coming in. So yes, I want to do a good job of fielding it and taking care of them. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Hey, another thing that I've got going on today is a tour. And I don't know how many other shop sign shop owners open their shops up, but we do several tours a year for like schools to Leadership Lufkin is like a leadership program in our local uh, chamber that comes through. There's also a high school program of, of these kids that are in the leadership program that come. And so we have a talk. We, we, we tour around the shop. They screen print their own t-shirt. Sometimes we'll make a vinyl sticker or something. But like we just open the doors and let them kind of see. And it always is such a positive you know, takeaway. Yeah, I, w- I wish like, more and more you know? people... I wish more and more people did that. I think that's an excellent thing. I would encourage you to even look beyond what you're currently doing just from a recruitment perspective, you know, like kids in school, they remember meeting, you know, the governor, the mayor, you know, (laughs) that that's what inspires people in the next generation to be in politics or, or or in education. When they, when they, you said it yourself at a young age, you learn from a, a, you know, a youth pastor and that's how, that's why you knew that that was something that you wanted to do. So I love that. I, I personally, I wish I did that. I, I had, I had, not really thought of the idea, but open houses, sign uh, like a sign shop open house, getting people to touch things, play with things. It's such a creative industry. You could do almost anything that you want. You can have them build little ra- glow in the dark reindeer if you want. You know, around this t- <laughs> around this time of the year. I mean, it'd be so cool. I encourage you to really explore that. Even come back to us with like, hey, how is this doing? Film it, throw it up on social media, get it out there in PR. Like I personally. Love that. Love that. I would tell every sign shop to do that. And you know another thing, though, the, the flip side of it is, yeah, it brings a burden to the team. They got to make sure their areas are clean and things like that. And I ask them all to have something running in all the departments. So that way we're cutting something on the table. We're flatbed. Yeah, printing you got to prep it. You got to prep it, right? You got to make sure. When you like, do the tour, running. you point at them 
and you say, hey, this is the operator who runs this machine. Tell us about what it does. Or here, here's the screen yeah. printer. Tell us how we're going to screen print our shirt today and let them shine for a minute. And what? that's a cool thing that they get to like show off. Hey, this is my skill. This is how I know to do. Let them uh, use the power washer and clean a screen and, you know, let, let them throw like start folding shirts. I agree. I agree. I would absolutely do it in any shop of any kind. Show how you do things. Show how you make the magic happen. You know, even in a small shop or a small town like yours or a large community like mine, that is needed in this business. The youth in the industry needs to know what they can do in this career. They could be designers. They could be foremen. They could be installers. They could work with their hands. They could be, you know, they could be bookkeepers. They could do anything that they want in industry. That is why I love it so much because you could wear many different hats. You could be a business background, a marketing background, a design background. You could be a contractor. You could be a manager. You could do anything you want. And the kids, the youth of this generation need to know. So I would, Chris, anybody who's listening out there needs to take your advice and get that done. Start bringing in your chamber of commerces, your networking groups, bring it all in. I'm not even talking about business owners. Like just, you could do it with anybody, an open house. You know, it doesn't have to be kids. It could be anyone. So yeah, man, way to end it on a positive note. I love that. I encourage others to do that. Thank you so much for being here, Chris. It was great to hear your story. I love having you on. I look forward to seeing you again on our mastermind calls. Uh, And and Brian, why don't you wrap it up here and, and then, you know, close us out. Guys, thanks for letting me ramble. I've enjoyed it. Oh, man. I knew this was going to be a slam dunk conversation, so I appreciate you joining us, man. Always, Brian knew, uh, like that Chris guy can talk; he'll fill an hour easy. Uh, <laughs> it's fun, no, though, man, man. It's really. I, I, honestly like you've been um, a, a great inspiration to me as well, and a, a good friend. And like hearing you like flex and, and like not even flex, but just share some of your experiences. Like I, I knew you had all this in you. I this is going to be tremendously helpful for all of our listeners. I, I know it will be because like you've been through this over over fifteen years or so that you've been running this business. I mean, and it's you know the takeaway for me is like when you truly enjoy what you're doing and you value what service you're providing as a a sign shop or a print shop or a wrap shop to your local community. Like that pays dividends. So if you're in a a small town and you're looking to grow and you're asking, how can I grow in a small town? You're asking the wrong question, right? The question is, how can I help my small town grow? Yeah. How can I help the other business owners in my small town grow their businesses and be more successful? Because to me, to like distill down everything that you've said, like that's the takeaway here is basically you guys came in with creative on the front end and out did anything that they were getting from other sign or print shops that were just there to provide a sign or provide print. Like you guys are actually investing in that small business that's coming to you. Like, Hey, we, we're going to make sure your design looks great. We're going to make sure that we help you put the pieces together. Like, Hey, you may come to us for a banner because you're trying to open a a new location, but guess what? We've got flyers that we can do for Mm -hmm. you. Like we're going to give you the whole package. So That's the takeaway for me. How do you grow in a a small shop or a small town? How can you grow your small town? How can you help other business owners in your small town? Chris, um, if you guys want to check out Chris and Real Graphics, it's realgraphics.com. I I don't want to flood you with calls, but I know. No, I enjoyed it. uh, Yeah. It's been a great being part of the community and connecting with more and more owners. It's been really encouraging. So it's awesome. And there's this me too therapy that's been really helpful, you know, to hear other people (laughs) talk about things like, Oh, me too. I'm not alone. You know? So I've enjoyed uh, the connection with you guys. So thanks so much and keep doing what you're doing. All right. All right. Thanks, Chris. Bye guys. Appreciate it guys. If you liked this episode, make sure you hit subscribe to get all the latest episodes and check out our website, bettersignshop.com. Get free resources and helpful tools on growing your shop. Thanks for listening.